I want to welcome you to this session. This is our fourth annual Landon Saunders Lecture, The Human Being, The Nexus of the World and Faith. And I am so privileged that we have Landon Saunders with us today. And I also want to tell you that without Landon Saunders and a contact that he made with Professor Wolf uh, in the past year, we would not be having this session together. And he called me afterwards and said it was just a wonderful session. And he thought if we could get Wolf to come and be the lecturer for this special event, that that would be uh, a wonderful way to connect what he's trying to do with his lecture on this nexus with the human being and faith and, and the world uh, to give it meaning and substance. And, and I, I think he's captured that and I really appreciate Landon's efforts to do that uh, for us this year. So with that said, let me say a little bit about Professor Wolf. He has actually been with us on one other occasion um, and I think that may have been five or six years ago, but we welcome him back. He is the Henry B. Wright Professor of Systematic Theology and the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He's a prolific author. The most recent publication I've read is Flourishing, Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World. A great book, but so are so many of the others that he's written. I was looking on Google and saw that he has a number of quotes that you can find, and I, I picked one, and I thought, okay, we'll go with this one. It is, theology is not only about understanding the world, it is also about mending the world. I thought Landon would like that one, because I think, again, it speaks to the, the connection that they've made and the purpose of this lecture. <clears throat> In addition to Professor Wolf, after his comments today, we will hear from three respondents. First off will be um, William Lofton Taylor, Turner, Turner, I knew that, sorry, um, who is special counsel at Lipscomb University. He is also a distinguished professor of leadership and public policy. So welcome to Dr. Uh, Mr. Turner. And next is Robert Randolph, who is the chaplain, first chaplain at MIT before he retired a couple of years ago. Uh, he also served as dean of students. We were privileged to honor him today, and we are grateful for his presence and the experience and wisdom he brings to sessions that deal with faith and the human being and the world. Um, and our third respondent will be Carissa Walters Wilson, who is an archivist with the Heartbeat Organization, of which Landon Saunders is the president. Um, she's also a professional speaker, uh, Christian education in churches and principles of biblical hermeneutics. And we look forward to hearing more from her as she archives the material from uh, the heartbeat communications programs that have been on for about 40 years now under Landon's direction. So um, I'll turn it over to Professor Wolf, and then we will have the respondents. Thank you. So maybe I should, do, do I need to do anything with this or is it good like, is it, it's good? Excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> I'm honored to be uh, uh, back at this event. It wasn't quite... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Theologians were supposed to be mending, the, I thought... <laughs> it's not going well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> I thought as soon as I start speaking, my word is powerful, but it isn't mending the world, it's destroying it. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Um, I'm delighted to be, it, uh, to be here um, at this conference for the second time uh, as well, and I'm particularly delighted to be able to honor with this lecture 
uh, Langdon Sanders. Um, I mean, he's not just uh, an impressive scholar. And I, as I, as I, after I've been invited, I've been digging a little bit things up to, to find out about uh, uh, about him. And uh, I realize that he hasn't been just an incredibly impressive scholar, but also profoundly force of shaping profoundly this denomination and broader. And this is what every theologian would actually want to be, a theologian that thinks uh, responsibly and uh, uh, in a deep way and at the same time is able to provide guidance for the, the particular denomination, for the church, and for the world at large. So the deep sense of being honored by being able to present here, I want to talk to you about religion in 2068, 67, you pick the, the year. <laughs> it doesn't matter, roughly 50 uh, years from, uh, from now. So, um, and what was in, important to me was the question of uh, where does it leave um, humanity, the intersection between religion and artificial intelligence and uh, kind of the nature of uh, humanity. So, in the year 15,017, a marginal monk by the name of Martin Luther started a religious revolution. Fifty years later, the religious, social, and political fabric of Europe was irreversibly altered. The invention of the printing press in the 15th century was a major technological breakthrough, and without it, Luther's work would have likely never resulted in the revolutionary process we know as the Protestant Reformation. And yet, for the most part, the world didn't look much different 50 years later, that is, in year 1567, then it did before Luther published his critical thesis about the state of Latin Christendom. People continued living in the same kind of houses, eating the same kinds of foods, wearing pretty much the same kinds of clothes. They used the same means of transportation and waged wars with the same kinds of weapons. When they got injured or sick, they're, they're <clears throat> they had their wounds and maladies treated by the same medical procedures. <coughs> in the 1517, it would have occurred to no one to spend much time thinking about how the world might look in 50 years. Everybody knew how the world would look. It would look the same as it did in 1517. The words of the author of Ecclesiastes, uh, of Ecclesiastes the words that Ecclesiastes wrote few centuries before, before Christ still, still very much applied then. Uh, let, me, let me drink some water here. My, I don't know what it is. <coughs> so the words of the author of Ecclesiastes, uh, written uh, centuries before Christ, still very much applied to Luther's world. What has been is what will be, and what has been done will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. True, people like Thomas More or Plato many centuries before him wrote about ideal societies. But More's Utopia, written roughly that year, 1516, was an exercise in moral imagination. It contained no plausible proposal about how to actually redesign the world. Its quaint subtitle was this, a truly golden little book, no less beneficial than entertaining, of a republic's best state and of the new island utopia. Now, utopia is literally Neverland or nowhere land, right? And only fools expected their children to see in their lifetimes anything like Utopia's version realized, vision realized. More himself certainly didn't. Now, in 2017, our daughter, Mira Francis, was born. 
When I imagine the world she will inhabit when she turns 50, I don't expect that it will be more or less the same as the one in which she was born. In a book called, my apologies, glad it was text message and not a phone call. <laughs> in a book called Social Acceleration, German sociologist Hartmut Rosa argues that acceleration is a basic feature of modernity. Acceleration not just of the pace of life, and therefore we are being constantly out of time. We're kind of in a total constant time deficit, right? We are debtors when it comes to time. We are rich in all sorts of other ways, but time, we're behind. Uh, we have to pay our debts. So pace of life has increased, but also acceleration of social change, and above all, acceleration of technological development. We know that in 50 years, the world will be markedly different from the way it is now, even if, as I will explain later, we do not know exactly how. Now, my topic here is not the world as a whole, but one significant slice of it, religion. What will be the state of religion in 2067, 8, 9, you pick the number, 50 years from now? Will religions still exist? Or will they perhaps retreat before the spread of universal quote unquote happiness as imagined in Huxley's brave new world? If religions survive, what role will they play in the lives of individuals and societies? Now, to avoid confusion, let me note that by religions, I do not refer to phenomena like nation state, although some consider it uh, religion, or soccer, sports, uh, as that matter, or as recently, Angamben, uh, uh, capitalism. I rather refer to something what scholars call world religions or secondary religions like Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam which emerged as a result of what some scholars call, call axial transformations. These religions are distinguished from so-called primary or local religions in many ways, but most notably in that they contain, they claim to contain visions of the true and good life for all human beings, rather than being oriented toward well-being simply of a particular tribe or group or locality. The universality of world religions follows, I think, from their stress on transcendence, on the existence of another quote-unquote world, uh, whether that's God or some other heaven or some other thing of this sort, transcendence, which is the origin of this world and or the source of its ultimate values. Now, not all scholars like the designation world religions. I will not try to persuade them, and maybe some of you are among them, I will not try to persuade you that I'm right and that you or they are wrong. I mention the term only to indicate that by religion I refer here to, relig to the religious traditions with this kind of pan-human, universally human scope. In fact, I will be speaking mostly about one such religion, the one which I identify with and I know the best, namely the Christian faith. But before attempting to peek into the future, it is good to remind, remind ourselves of some basic facts about the spread and role of religions today. So whether they live in Atlanta, Buenos Aires, Sydney, or Zagreb. Zagreb is in Croatia, by the way. <laughs> Most educated people in the West don't think the future of religion is particularly bright. The influence of religion will gradually decrease, they tend to believe, and those who practice religion will gradually shrivel to a small minority, little islands of cultural backwardness and superstition dotting the sea of humans going about 
doing their worldly pursuit, uh, uh, going about their worldly pursuits. Intellectual elites embrace the so-called secularization thesis, a dominant view about the future of religion over the past two centuries. Religions are headed for the scrapyard of partly useless and partly harmful illusions. Advances in science and technology will make them superfluous. So will world become secular in 2067. In, in 1950, members of educated classes thought no different about the future of religion than they do today. They expected that religion would become marginal and irrelevant, count 50 years from, 15, uh, from 1950, that's 2000. They would become irrelevant by 2000. But as many people have shown, in only 35 years from 1970 to 2005, religions grew in absolute and relative terms. Adherents of all major world religions increased, most religious boasting spectacular, in fact, gains. Buddhists from 233 million in, seven, in 1970 to 379 million. Christians from, uh, from uh, 1,000 or 1.23 billion, 1.23 billion, right? to 2.13 billion. Hindus, from 463,000 million to 870 million. Jews, minor increase, but increase nonetheless, from 14 to 15 million, and then spectacularly Muslims, from 550 million, half a billion, to 1.3 billion. World religions have continued growing steadily since 2005, especially Christianity and Islam. There are sp uh, spaces here, unless you insist on standing, that's fine with me, I will not be disturbed, but I want to make sure if we can make just a two minute break if you want to come down and sit. If not, fine, where you are. <laughs> Yeah, up front also, places. So as I mentioned, world, uh, mentioned world re religions have continued to grow since 2005. By 2030, Muslim population of the planet is expected to reach about 2.2 billion. Um, during the same period, um, the number of adherents of those religions grew not just in absolute terms, but also in relative terms. The greater proportion of world population belong to these religions as well, from 67.8% to about 72.4%. But today, religions are not just vibrant, they're also force in public life. In 1950, religion was in fact more privatized than it is today. The authors of God's Century book that was published in 2011, a book subtitled Resurgent Religions and Global Politics, note the shift in the role and ambitions of religions at the beginning of 21st century. Over the past four decades, religion's influence on politics has reversed from decline and became powerful on every continent and across every major world religion. Earlier confined to home, the family, the village, the mosque, synagogue, temple, the church, religion came to exert its influence in parliaments, presidential palaces, lobbyists' offices, campaigns, militant training camps, negotiation rooms, protest rallies, city squares, and dissident jails. Workplaces increasingly are sites of prayer rooms and small scripture studies. In the course of the second half of the last century, the world was in fact rapidly de-secularizing. The term comes from the sociologist Peter Berger in his book, The Desecularization of the World, Resurgent Religions and World Politics. He described the developments, kinds of developments that, that I've just sketched. 
For him to talk about desecularization was a complete about face. For in the 1960s, he was one of the main proponents of the secularization thesis. So that's about religion in past 50 years. But will the vibrancy of religions with their numerical growth and public assertiveness with these things continue? More importantly, I think for me, will religions remain relevant irrespective of their growth? Or will the prophets of secularization who were consistently wrong about religion in 20th century and at the beginning of 21st century prove right about religion in the second half of 21st century. Let me just uh, make a slight detour to prepare for the point that I will make a little bit later on, and that's to answer the question, but how much do we, can we actually know about what's gonna happen in 50 years from now? <laughs> Those who say that they know what the world will be like in 50 years, they either don't know that they don't know, <laughs> or they pretend to know what they know that they don't know. <laughs> in Critical Path, uh, Buckminster Fuller proposed the knowledge doubling curve, an exponential increase in the rate of human knowledge. Until 1900s, human knowledge doubled about every century. By 1945, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. By 1982, it was doubling every 12 to 13 months. Building on Fuller's thesis, IBM came out with a report in July 2006 predicting that the knowledge by 2020 would be doubling every 12 to 13 hours. Now, we're very close to that, and I haven't been able to track and see whether anybody has uh, seen how these predi predictions panned out, but it's absolutely stunning. If, if, if they're half right, right, it's incredible. If they're, if they're a tenth right, it's stunning. But that's not the whole picture. The exponential growth of knowledge isn't the whole story. Um, in 2013, Samuel Abersman wrote a book half, called The Half-Life of Facts. And he noted that knowledge wasn't just growing, but it was decaying <laughs> as well. <laughs> Some of what we think is secure knowledge is proving to be mere erroneous opinion. Both the exponential growth in knowledge and the high rate of knowledge decay make predictions about future risky. We simply don't know what we will know and what we will be able to do in 50 years. Jonathan Schell made an observation that futurology has never been a respectable field of inquiry. <laughs> And that seems to be true today more than it ever has been. So, since I'm skeptic about how much we can know about the world in 2067, I think that it is futile to speculate, for instance, about the character of religious communities in 50 years, provided, of course, that they're still around. Will the current trend toward democratization, social networks, and charismatic forms of authority continue, or will new hierarchical forms of sacred authority be invented, new way ways of enforcing conformity to religious precepts? Will the works of Thomas Tallis and John, uh, uh, Johann Seb Sebastian Bach be played at church services, or will they give way to infinite variety of devotionally inspiring uh, AI-composed music, <laughs> that might be a possibility too. People speak about uh, AI compositions, right? And so uh, the, the, that will be in infinitely alluring and stimulating, and so that may be one option. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, <laughs> but judging by trends, uh, it's gonna be less and less, certainly of Thales, and maybe less and less on Bach, of Bach uh, as well. 
We don't know, and basically, and it's pointless to speculate. My concern in this lecture is not so much the form of religion in the future, but its existence, and more importantly, its role in human life. In 50 years, will religion be rendered superfluous, or will they remain a domain of human experience, unreachable by science and technology, to which religions will continue to speak? If religion remains alive, what role will it have? I can think of two possible scenarios under which religion would disappear, and only one of which has anything to do with scientific and technological advances. So here's the first possible scenario, a low-tech one. For almost 2,000 years, Christians have lived in eager expectation, or often in fear, of the coming of God's kingdom. As the last book of the Bible, the Revelation of St. John, puts it, they were hoping for a new heaven and a new earth, for a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God. If that event were to occur before 2017, <laughs> it would end religion. <laughs> Many commentators on Revelation have noted that the New Jerusalem has no temple. That's not because on the New Earth people will have finally realized that there's no God, <laughs> but in a sense for exactly the opposite reason. The New Jerusalem, a uh, city that people are meant, uh, as well as uh, architectural landscape, New Jerusalem itself is portrayed as a temple. In fact, as the most sacred inner core of the ancient Jewish temple, the Holy of Holies. That's why New Jerusalem has this cubic shape. It's a, it, it's a, it's a crazy dimensions, uh, huge, and in, in cube. You've never seen a city like that, and if you did, you think this is completely insane. Nobody builds cities like that. But the idea is that obviously it's a symbolic representation of the immensity and the holiness of the city as a landscape and city as a people um, there. Now, so, and if New Jerusalem is holy of holies, uh, holy of holies are generally in temple. Where's the temple for the New Jerusalem? And it's clearly stated, God is the temple of that holy of holies. So, as John the Seer describes the future, God will be so deeply present in the lives of people that they will no longer need to pray to God or even to obey God, for God will be with them and in them, and they will do God's will as their second nature. Will God's kingdom come during the next 50 years? Through the centuries, many Christians have been persuaded that the end is right around the corner. The last time that I read about it was, was when I was teaching uh, a summer course at Fuller. And uh, I think it was at 89 reasons why Jesus is going to come in 1989. And the date was all set, and the date that was set, I was teaching a, a course, intensive course, on ecclesiology and eschatology. And the date was set just when we finished uh, <laughs> ecclesiology. <laughs> and, before, and before we started eschatology, and I was trying to negotiate with Puller to pay me the whole thing beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> uh, but obviously, it's not just that Christians who predicted that uh, the second coming is around the corner obviously did not know. They failed to understand that they could not have known. As Jesus himself said, only God can know when the end of the old world and the beginning of the new will occur. Now, the other possibility, high-tech possibility, of the disappearance of religion is 
if some other form of life superior to humans supplants human beings, that is, in some circles, very much a live possibility, though it's high highly unlikely to happen within the time frame that we are considering. Most experts believe that a superhuman artificial general intelligence will be developed. They differ on estimation of, of how far we are presently from such an invention. One or more such uh, uh, AIs could conquer and kill all human beings. And this is one of the possible scenarios possible, not highly probable, not necessarily probable, but possible scenarios for the relation between artificial intelligence and human beings that Max Tegmark sketches in his book Life 3.0, 3 being human in an age of artificial intelligence. Such extinction of humanity would spell the end of religion. No human would be there to let the starry heavens above and the moral law within fill their mind with admiration and awe and give rise to the idea of creator, as Immanuel Kant put it. No one would be there to light a candle in gratitude or supplication, no one to study ancient books and draw wisdom from the life, for life from them. Religion would disappear because humans would be no more or religion might have an afterlife in something like a cultural memory of this new form of life as a part of its prehistory. Now, I'm no expert. Uh, in this, from what, what I could read, it is far more likely that humans will be upgraded rather than supplanted. And this upgrading is already in the process, meaning uh, there will be enhanced human beings. So the question of then might be better, is it likely that the en enhanced human beings, humans, for instance, with significantly expanded lifespans, with vastly improved, in improved intelligence, with an immense range of possible experiences and states of consciousness, with an increased ability to manage their desires, all of which are sketched as possibly improvable uh, on what we can do uh, today. Will such human beings need and want religion? And if so, what would religion do for them? What good would it be? Will upgrading, will upgraded humans at some point morphed into post-humans, which is to say beings who have transcended their own human nature? That's also a question that people ask. If so, what is the line separating merely upgraded humans from genuine post-humans? Now, there's a big debate that's going on. Um, Nick Bostrom from the University of Oxford, one of the most respectable researchers uh, on the matter, he says that, <coughs> that post-humans are humans whose at least one general central capacity, such as health span, cognition, and, emo and emotion, has greatly exceeded the maximum attainable in any general capacity by any current human being without recourse to new technological means. So ordinary human beings don't have uh, that high level of general capacity, not just individual segmented capacity, but more general capacity of the kind he mentions. Um, now the question is, should we consider such beings as upgraded that have one such capacity, or do we consider them as truly transhuman? I don't know how to draw that uh, line. And I don't have really much to say about the matter, except to make two observations. Uh, one, uh, I draw from my, the, the idea I draw from my Yale colleague, Kathy Tanner, who's noted in her book, Christ the Key, that plasticity, she calls it plasticity, is an important feature of human nature. That is to say that it's not nailed and completely stable, unchangeable, but it's plastic, shapeable, changeable. Now, the Renaissance humanist, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, 
was an early advocate of this idea. In his famous oration on the dignity of man in 1486, he has the creator speak following words to Adam, the first human. We have made thee neither of heaven nor of earth, neither mortal nor immortal, so that with freedom of choice and with honor, as though the maker and molder of thyself, thou mayest fashion thyself in whatever shape thou shalt prefer, thou shalt have the power to degenerate into lower forms of life, which are brutish, thou shalt have power out of thy soul's judgment to be reborn into higher forms, which are divine. That's 1486. Now, Pico della Mirandola is the saint of transhumanists. And that's because he was pushing human plasticity over the edge. Higher forms of humans are, in fact, more than human. They are divine. And that leads me to my second observation. There is a limit to what humans can upgrade themselves into with the help of technology without ceasing to be human. Whether the project of transcending humanity is worthy of being pursued, that's the central question for me, depends on whether we believe that human being is something that ought to be overcome. That's a kind of fundamental sensibility of many of the transhumanists, as has been of many people through the ages, that human beings as they are, we as, they are, as we are, ought to be overcome. Nietzsche is famous with overcoming the, uh, but that, uh, that's because of a kind of Schopenhauer behind him. Now, um, you, if you um, need to be persuaded that indeed human beings should be overcome, Think of the processes of decomposition of a human corpse. Or what happens in human digestion, in the processes of human digestion. If that doesn't uh, kind of lower your estimation of who human beings are, then pick up the two volumes uh, of, Schopen, uh, of Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, and read his pessimistic philosophy. You have a litany of, of our, uh, our limitations, and not just limitations, and of uh, uh, kinds of things that make you, um, well, not think very highly of yourself <laughs> if you do. But if you're still not persuaded, then maybe you can go to either some of the church fathers who had very similar kind of uh, assessment of the nature of human body, or if then you're not persuaded, then go to Martin Luther. <laughs> we can put it a bit extremely, and we'll, we'll forgive, you'll forgive me a bit crassly, that Martin Luther couldn't quite decide about which one's worse about humans, the fact that they sin or the fact that they sh shit. <laughs> <laughs> There is a story that Martin Luther came to the doctrine of justification by faith while he was sitting on the latrine. Ah. <laughs> uh, and the, the two are, are tied because for him, being, being who has to sit on the latrine must be a, a, a significantly compromised kind of a, a being not worthy of dignity unless the dignity is confirmed on the, on the one. Still, uh, presumably, you, you, you won't go with any of these, uh, these, these thinkers, uh, and I'm with you completely. I, I agree. Um, as there is beauty and goodness to being an eagle or a dolphin, or for the matter, matter that bluebird uh, for whom I wait every spring to come and I see per perched on the, that little house that we built, for her, if there is beauty, as there is beauty for these creatures, so I believe there is beauty to being human and no more than human. After all, the central article of the Christian faith is that the divine word became human flesh. By making its own dwelling place, the word sanctified 
sovereignty in its fititude and in its fragility. So for me, the question about religion half a century from today is not about religion in a possible world in which humans have shed skin of their humanity in order to transition into as of yet undefined form of existence, one that promises to transcend Homo sapiens in a much more radical way than some 200,000 years ago Homo sapiens transcended Homo erectus. It is rather about the future of religion in the world of technologically advanced and enhanced human beings, beings with biological bodies and living in time and space, radically dependent on their environment and free at the same time, incapable of escaping the risks of existential trust and by nature oriented toward objects of their love, creatures capable of both suffering and joy. Pretty much creatures like we are. Uh, just uh, improved versions <laughs> of ourselves a bit. Wh where the improvement, uh, uh, how far improvement goes before it, it becomes counterproductive, that's a very interesting question in terms of vulnerability, fragility. All these questions, I think some of you here are probably concerned about transhumanism. I, I think we have good reasons to be, uh, even if not... Um, uh, with regard to specifically transhumanist movement, but to technological advances that uh, obviously uh, are significant and that will change and transform the way in which we think about uh, ourselves and which we as humans live. Those who expect ac accelerating scientific and technological advances to end religions, they make, this is my claim, two major mistakes. One about religions, and the other about science. The mistake ab about religion has two aspects. The first is the conviction that religion is primitive science. Bereft of reasoned and methodologically rigorous explanations, human beings used religious imagination to explain the origin and nature of the universe. That's the theory. Along with Jews and Muslims, Christians claim, for instance, that God created human beings. But that must be false, critics argue, because we know that the process which began with the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago resulted in emergence of human animals. Now, as primitive science, the argument concludes, religion is obsolete and superfluous science, irrational and in many ways harmful. I want to respond to the mistake, however, to think of the Christian faith as science, competing with the natural sciences for explanations of how the world and humans came to be and how they function. Granted, the Christian faith contains creation stories that claim to be true, and the plausibility of the faith depends on truthfulness of these stories. But the stories of creation are true in a different sense than scientific theories. They are not meant to explain and chronologically order the sequence of cosmic and terrestrial transformations until we see the human being appear. In other words, they're not supposed to do what the sciences do. To say that God created human beings, for instance, is not to assert necessarily that God's action interrupts the chain of cosmic causes and effects leading to the existence of humans, but it is fundamentally to assert that human beings belong with the world in its entirety, that human beings along with the world in its entirety are, if you want, caused by God or created by God or maybe more poetically are the fruit of God's love. Now, those who think that religion is primitive science often add that religion is also primitive technology. This is a second mistake when it comes to religion. To live successfully in the world, humans need to manipulate their environment and make it serviceable to their ends. They need to gather and grow and prepare food, make shelter and clothing, ward predators and diseases, and so on. If they fail, if we fail, we die. As human knowledge and power often prove inadequate to these tasks, especially in the past, human beings resorted to magic and rituals, to incantations and prayers, all designed to make higher powers do for them 
what they couldn't quite do for themselves. As a primitive technology, the argument concludes, religion is increasingly obsolete and superfluous. Just to give you an example, <coughs> um, some years back, I taught a course at Yale uh, entitled Faith and Globalization. And the uh, person teaching co from Yale, co-teaching with me, uh, was from School of Management and the Secularist. His father was a minister somewhere back, or a grandfather, but he himself was a secularist. At one point, without warning me what's going to happen, during the class, <laughs> he reached into his pocket, picked out a pill, and showed it to the students. When they're sick, he said, religious people pray, believing that God will perform a miracle. Secular people, on the other hand, rely on the marvels of modern medicine, like this tiny pill that takes care of your blood pressure in a few moments after you have taken it. Still holding the pill, he concluded that the modern medicine obviously works better than God. I didn't quite know what to, what to tell him. <laughs> Why do you have students here in front of you? So, so I, said, I said to him, you and I agree on one very important thing. We both deny, reject the same God. And he kind of looked puzzled uh, at me. And I said, God, you deny, is incompatible with human inventiveness and work, in fact, incompatible with all worldly processes. I deny that God as well. I'm atheist with respect to that God. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, when, you, when you survey all the possibilities, I'm about 80, 90 percent atheist. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, and in contrast, the God whom I believe make po makes possible the entirety of the world real, 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 reality in all its dynamic complexity, including human inventiveness and work. It's very easy to show that you just have to look to the first pages of the Bible and see such God at work. In the Garden of Eden, God didn't drop food from heaven into the mouths of Adam and Eve and applying pressure to the jaw so, so that they would <laughs> chew it. Uh, <laughs> they worked for food, tilling and keeping the garden, and in their work, God was at work too. It's a mistake to think that human work, including technological advances humanity has made, and divine work mutually exclude one another. The humans humans who came to believe I'm sorry um, this is a correction to my text that, that isn't, isn't better than what I wrote <laughs> originally. <laughs> You know the problem with editing and discarding, you know, it's, you, you, you have to be sure that your second version is better than the first. <laughs> Otherwise, a kind of downward spiral of, <laughs> of improvements. <laughs> kind of the text dying of improvement. Uh, <laughs> so the god of the great monotheist traditions, in, hum in whom humans believed when they had no clue about how universe came to its current state. God of humans who believed when, the, when uh, the best antiseptic they knew was lavender, and when dominant means of transportation were their own two callous bare feet. You can believe in that same God if you are modern, when you are exploring the astrophysical quantum properties of black holes, editing the genome to prevent diseases and enhance human capacities, and traveling in driverless cars. The same will be true, I believe, 50 years from now, irrespective of any and all scientific and technological advances. So, you're good Christians here, most of you. <laughs> 
though God knows your hearts. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Let's say you agree with me. Because God's activity and human ingenuity are not in competition with one another, we can believe in God, notwithstanding all the spectacular advances in science and technology. But why should we? What good would it be to believe? And this brings me to the mistake about science contained in the thesis that the development in science and technology will make religion wither away. To be human is to live a vision of the good life. A vision of the good life sketches a portrait of what kind of humans we ought to be and provides criteria, kind of the tables of values. Any vision has uh, not 10 commandments necessarily, right? Two tables of the law, but some tables of values it must have. So idea of who human beings are and some tables of values for what we ought to desire and how we ought to live. We all live by some such vision, whether we consciously embrace it, keeping it vividly before our eyes and seeking to align our lives with it, or, as it happens sometimes, it remains incohate, hidden from our sight, woven into the fabric of our beliefs and practices, and we let ourselves unreflectively be pushed by it from the behind, so to speak. In either case, we live by a vision of the good life. Since visions of the good life are by definition normative, they spell what you ought to do, they're normative in character, science cannot formulate them. Knowledge about what was, what is, and what is likely to be, no matter how precise and detailed, can never prescribe what ought to be. When it comes to the good life, the flourishing life, true life, the main role of, sci of the sciences is to enlighten us about human nature and behavior and help us identify the most effective ways by which to live in the way we have determined on other grounds, or maybe no grounds at all, that we ought to live. Imagine that we decided to give up on privacy and permit all the available data about us to be collected. In fact, for the most part, we've decided that, right? <laughs> and, and, and actually, we sold that privacy for the right to use free uh, internet, right? So that's, uh, we are pretty much in that situation, not quite where I want you, us to be for the purposes of my experiment here, uh, but, uh, but close to it. So imagine all our conversations, all our correspondence, correspondence is okay, if you use Gmail, everything's recorded. <laughs> all our conversations, all our correspondence, data about our health, our habits, about the history of our purchases, about all the books we have read, films we have seen, all the comments about them we have made, if you use Kindle. Um, a highly intelligent algorithm would be able to come up with an exceptionally accurate account of your character and behavior. It would therefore be likely to reliably predict what you will do in many situations. It may even come to know you and us better than we know ourselves. Now a scenario, this is a scenario which you all know Harari, with which Newell uh, Harari ends his book Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. But the one thing such highly intelligent algorithm wouldn't not be able to tell us is who we ought to be, what we ought to do, and toward what do we ought we stretch ourselves. It could tell us what we actually desire. It could tell us what we find desirable. It could tell us what we believe that we ought to desire. <laughs> All of it it would know, but it would remain mute when it comes to what we ought to desire, who we as humans ought to be. Science cannot give us a vision of true and good life. For a vision of a true and good life, we have to go to religion. It can be non-theist religion, like Buddhism or Confucianism, it could be quasi-religion, like varieties of modern atheist humanism, 
or even Nietzsche's philosophy. Or it could be a theist, religion like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But it will be a religion, not a worldview, not simply a philosophy, but a vision of life that elicits and guides existential commitment. Now, world religions do many things, and some things they do, or some of the things that people who espouse them do in the name of religion are deeply troubling. For instance, we often use religion to mark a difference between us and them, to provide a foundation for political unity and cooperation. That's what religions have done through the centuries, and that's what some people think they will do also in the future. They will distinguish between us and them, in felicitous phrase of Harari, they will tell us whom should we, for whom should we care and whom we should bomb. To turn to the Christian faith, to turn the, but to turn the Christian faith into political religion, which is what this is then, is to betray its universality. Christian faith is a pan-human creed, as are other monotheisms and I believe other world religions. By definition, the one God is the God of the whole of humanity. In significant sense, there is no us and them. There is us in God's world. Believers in such a God can only love their own nation in the community with all other nations and must act in obedience to universal moral precepts rather than simply in their national interest. Um, just brief footnote. This is a terribly important thing to emphasize precisely in the current moment in which we find ourselves uh, in the West. In this country, but in maybe in, in, in some ways intellectually even more clearly articulated in some of the European countries, the Unitarian movements are fundamentally denying, a lot of them are, uh, our common humanity. So that the common humanity is a secondary to our specificity as, uh, as human beings. And in that sense, you have return of many gods into the world. And some of them do that in the name of, uh, of explicitly defended uh, kind of modern versions of paganism. So I think uh, this, this is a politically extraordinarily important uh, and personally very important uh, issue. So though Christian faith can be practiced as identity marker, the character of its major convictions indicate that its main purpose is different. It, it primarily means to guide us how we should live and make that kind of life possible. I don't mean to describe Christian faith as a moralizing faith, uh, to exclude God's action on our behalf, to the contrary. It is a vision of a true and good life. The same is the case, I believe, with other world religions. To live is to have a vision of life, but to live is also to make an existential commitment to orient our lives toward a goal, toward the specified by that vision. It is to have an object of love that gathers all our desiring and gives meaning to our lives. Such existential commitment is possible only as an act of trust, not blind trust, but trust that involves risk nonetheless. When it comes to existential commitments, we always strive for more than we can rationally justify and for more than we can guarantee will succeed. That's the part of existential risk. To put it slightly differently, as humans, we cannot exempt ourselves from staking the course of our lives and I quote now, on suppositions whose grounds fail to do justice to the gravity of their implications and to the scope of their claims. We have to stake the course of our lives on what we cannot fully justify, what we cannot fully secure for us. We can reason about the merits and demerits of embracing a particular vision of life, but in the end, I think, Blaise Pascal was right when he noted centuries ago that we must make a wager. In fact, we always find ourselves already having made a wager. To live is to make the wager of life. The challenge 
is to bet wisely. Now, when I put it in terms of bet, it uh, doesn't sound so <laughs> appealing, but in some ways, uh, it, it, it is a bet, right? The question is not whether we will love and trust in this existential kind of a way. The question is what or whom will we love and trust? In their teachings, world religions spell out alternative objects of existential trust and love. In the lives of their best exemplars, their founders and saints or sages, each religion displays how living a vision of the good life looks in a given time and given place and how our lives may turn out if we were to embrace it. The world's religions aren't like antiquated Viking ship on which humanity used to rely to cross the ocean of life before the invention of modern jets. Their most enduring and compelling visions of the good life humanity has known, candidates, I say candidates only, for the most important choice we all must make. Each is contending with others for the truth and goodness of our lives, for our very humanity. Not all of them can be true, at least not in their entirety, though their versions of the true and good life are partly overlapping. They are also colliding. We will have to make discerning judgments about our life in the light of everything we know about nature of the world and humanity and make a wager. The more power we have, this is the point I want to underscore, the more power we have, the more important it is to choose wisely the basic direction of our lives. The more intelligent and powerful tools we create, the clearer we must be about the human purposes and tools we serve. Uh, about human purposes, the tools will serve. And the only way to discern what purposes are worthy of, worthy of our humanity is to know what we ought to trust and what we ought to love above all things and what kind of human beings we ought to be. Since religions contain some of the most enduring answers to these questions, accelerating scientific and technological advances is not likely to make religion unnecessary, but to the contrary, to make it even more necessary and needed. Give me three more minutes and I will conclude. Surrounded by spectacular technology, in 2067 we will recognize the, import will we recognize the importance, for instance, of the Christian faith. It's hard to tell. Perhaps most of us will be conditioned by social engineering, um, so that we will not be able to help behaving as we ought to behave. And in, if anything should go wrong, a miracle drug will give us holiday from facts. This is, these are quotes from Huxley, uh, The Brave New World, which is uh, incredibly relevant uh, today. And what seemed like dystopia then for him, uh, as written as dystopia, is now looks like utopia for so many. <laughs> One thing uh, is sure, if you look at it from the Christian perspective, like the swine in, this, in Jesus' parable who trampled over the pearls because they could not eat them, we will then turn away from what matters the most and squander what is best in our humanity. As I use it here, the image of swine trampling pearls is not so much an accusation against those who despise religion, as it is actually the challenge to those of us who embrace it. It is a call to make sure that the pearl of our faith doesn't get lost in the garbage pile of our re distorted religiosity. Will Christian faith have life-shaping role in 2067? That depends less on the effects of accelerating scientific and technological developments and depends more, not exclusively, but more than on that, depends on the ability of Christians not to let the dark hole of their distorted religiosity swallow the light of their faith. Science and technology will not destroy the Christian faith, but Christians themselves might.
The crucial question for the future of religion is the one Jesus posed two millennia ago. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Landon Saunders for inviting me to be a part of this lecture, and I'm really honored to be uh, here and uh, talking about this uh, topic today. And I'm really grateful for the wonderful paper that uh, uh, Dr. Volf just gave, uh, that Miroslav just gave. Thank you. It is uh, an amazing paper. In this thoughtful and insightful treatise, Miroslav raises a number of conundra, mind teasers really, that are both profound and provocative regarding the future existence and practices of world major religions and how they may manifest in the year 2068, 50 years hence the writing of this paper. He touches upon several significant and tantalizing concepts and uh, philo philosophical positions that shape uh, the complexity of his forethought. And I will just address very briefly uh, uh, several of those uh, in intriguing points. First of all, he talks about the technological advances that have changed the world in meaningful and profound ways. Uh, and whereas the printing press made little appreciable uh, difference in the daily lives of uh, the world uh, at a large 50 years post its introduction, uh, the same cannot be said for the advent of the growth of technology, particularly the proliferation of personal electronic uh, devices and access to the world wide web that have propelled connectivity through media, social, and otherwise, and its dramatic impact on everyday life occurrences throughout the world. Uh, comparably speaking, the order of change has been exponential and is having a significant impact on faith, uh, knowledge, development, formation, experience, and practices, particularly relative to how we export and consume spiritual knowledge and understanding. So unlike the relative lethargy and temporal inertia associated with the advent of the printing press, though ultimately its impact was quite profound, changes associated with the dawn of technology are having a more visceral impact pact relative to uh, religion, its advancement, its practice, and its criticism. And whereas the fundamental truths associated with the great religions have not shifted significantly, how we understand those truths, apply them to our everyday life experiences, and how we implement them has changed significantly. The television, live streaming, blogs, post, Instagram, Facebook, Moreover, the intentionality of spiritual practice and its accessibility and immediacy have forever altered uh, the urgency and viability of the understanding and practice of religion. Moreover, in the 16th century, very few persons were literate or had accessibility to Christian documents. Christian doctrine was carefully controlled by the learned and the literate. Uh, the vast majority of the population at that time was neither. And while the world seemed to move at a glacial pace in the 16th century, changes in recent times appear to be changing at warp speed. Um, I, I won't talk so much about the fact that uh, there is some evidence, at least that's put upon by sociologists and uh, economists that uh, uh, actual religion is changing uh, and, and growing at actually a rapid pace and that uh, it's project projected to be 25 times larger than the growth of the unreligious between uh, 2010 and 2050. And so I think that uh, uh, there is a lot of change that's happening, a lot of growth uh, uh, that's happening uh, in, in, that, uh, in that domain. And the last point I want to make, and this has to do uh, with a sort of a psychology and behavioral concerns associated with religion. I'm a psychologist by training, and so this is particularly important to me, and I'm looking at it through this lens. So scholars are trying to tease out the complex factors that drive an individual or a nation toward uh, atheism, but there are a few commonalities. 
first. Uh, part of religion's appeal is that it offers security in an uncertain world, which I think you really spoke about very beautifully. So not surprisingly, nations that report the highest rates of atheism tend to be those that provide their citizens with relatively high economic, political, and existential st stability. Second, according to Phil Zuckerman, a professor of sociology and secular studies at Pitzer College at Claremont, uh, in Claremont, California, security in um, society seems to diminish religious belief. Capitalism, access to technology and education also seem to correlate with a corrosion of religiosity in some populations. And number three, decline, however, does not mean disappearance, uh, says uh, Ara uh, Norenzian, a social psychologist at the University of British Columbia. Existential security is more fallible than it seems in a moment Everything can change. A drunk driver can kill a loved one. A tornado can destroy a town. A doctor can uh, issue a terminal diagnosis. As climate change wreaks havoc on the world in the coming years and natural resources potentially grow scarce, then suffering and hardship could fuel uh, religiosity. People want to escape suffering, so if they can't get out of it, they want to find meaning. For some reason, religion seems to give meaning to suffering, m much more so than any other secular ideal or belief that we know of. Think about classic books like Viktor Frank Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning or Elie Wiesel's Night, which talk uh, about the profound suffering that, uh, that he went through or that they both went through. And just finally, uh, it's a hard habit to break. Religion is a hard habit to break. Uh, atheists fight against all of the cultural and evolutionary baggage that religion brings. Human beings naturally want to believe that they are part of something bigger, that life isn't completely futile. Our minds crave purpose and explanation. With education, exposure to science and critical thinking, people might stop trusting their institutions, but the institutions are still there. On the other hand, science, uh, the system of choice that many non-believers and atheists look for uh, in understanding the natural world, isn't uh, an easy cognitive pill to swallow. Uh, we must accept that the earth spins, even though we never experience that sensation ourselves. We must uh, embrace the idea that evolution is utterly indifferent and that there is no ultimate design or purpose in the universe, even though our intuition tells us differently. And we also find it difficult to admit that we are wrong to resist our own biases and to accept the truth that truth as we understand it is ever changing as an empirical data are gathered and tested. All staples of science. Science is cognitively unnatural and difficult. Our religion, on the other hand, is mostly something we don't even have to learn because we already know it. So, Finally, I said finally before, but I do mean it this time. <laughs> For all of these reasons, psychological, neurological, historical, cultural, logistical, experts guess that religion will probably never go away. Religion, whether it's maintained through fear or love, is highly successful at perpetuating itself. If not, it would no longer be with us. Miroslav, we're all in your debt for the provocative presentation. After 37 years at MIT, I came away from reading the paper feeling I should have spent more time with my friends in AI. <laughs> but I'm thankful as well that you did outline a scenario where we would not have to go mano a mano with Hal from the Space Odyssey. 
or push Martin Luther off the toilet. <laughs> You've walked us through doors where religion in 50 years might have disappeared. If the prayer we pray each Sunday, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, becomes reality, or if we are surpassed by a superior form of humanity, then we don't need to worry. The matter is settled. But of course it's not. You note the problem involving capabilities of humankind, how plasticity might well allow us to grow into superior beings. But you point as well to some point when what is uniquely human might cease to exist. Created in the image of God, you reminded us the divine deign to become like us, and his presence with us left us only a bit lower than the angels. We know where we want to be, but our problem is we simply can't fly that high on our own. Christian faith is not science telling us how humankind evolved. It is rather a faith that offers a vision of how we might live. And that vision will be needed in 50 years as much as it is needed today. If only we might shape a vision. Landon, in whose name we've been called together today, has given his life to shaping such a vision. And in our efforts, we are trying to give form and substance to lightning in a bottle. And the real difficulty is it's very hard. Visions flicker, they hide. They are illusions that are birthed with such difficulty that we settle for theological jousting over matters that do not shape lives but rather build walls to separate us from one another. I'm reminded of one of Fred Craddock's stories. He told when he was a 20-year-old that he read Schweitzer's Quest for the Historical Jesus and was like many of us, were filled, was filled with questions about it. And he knew Schweitzer was to be in Cleveland to play a dedicatory concert on a great organ. So Craddock, bought a bus ticket from Knoxville and went to Cleveland with his copy of the book and a pad of questions he would ask if given the chance. The concert was followed by a time in the fellowship hall and he was in the front row with all of his questions. Schweitzer came out, he spoke to the crowd. He said, you've been very warm and very hospitable to me and I thank you for it. And I wish I could stay longer with you, but I must go back to Africa. I must go back to Africa because my people are poor and they're diseased and they're dying. They're hungry and I have to go. We have a medical station. If there's anyone in this room who has the love of Jesus, would you be prompted to go with me and help me? And Craddock looked down at his questions. They were absolutely stupid. <laughs> and he wrote, and I learned again what it means to be Christian and had hopes that I could be that someday. Craddock had questions. Schweitzer had a vision. Theological gymnastics that produce creeds that divide do not give us a vision for living, but rather a roadmap for creating communities of isolation rather than communities of conversation. Too often the great question of Sunday is very simple. Will we get out of services in time to beat our neighbors to the cafeteria? <laughs> so the question is, how then shall we live? Is it enough to define our communities of faith by theological correctness, or do we have the courage to cast a broader vision? That might begin by seeking to understand what you have referenced as world religions. Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and the ideas and visions that we share with those folk. We often have conversations across faith boundaries that focus on differences, let me suggest that we think more about commonalities. As a chaplain to the Institute, I was challenged to oversee a diverse gaggle of chaplains and even more challenged to learn how much we held in common. The great religions share a desire to bring order and meaning and wholeness to the lives that they guide. 
if we are to avoid the dark hole of distorted religiosity that you speak about, we had best give attention to our commonalities. And now for some specifics of what a vision for relevance might include. As Christians, we do not take time to develop, we have not taken time to develop a viable vision for the care of creation, and we need it now. We certainly will need it in 50 years. Maybe we should be talking about when Stevenson's book, What We're Fighting For Now Is Each Other, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Climate Justice, published in 2015. Gwen grew up in Churches of Christ, worshiped with us at Brookline, and lives today in the Boston suburbs. As Christians, we do not take time for developing a vision of what we should be saying about immigration. Maybe we should be talking about Mark Hamilton's Jesus, the King of Strangers, what the Bible says, really says, about immigration. We do not take time for serious continuing conversations about why black lives do matter. Maybe we should be talking about Richard Hughes, Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. There are other topics that will call for our attention if we are to be relevant in 50 years. What about our relationships to the LGBTQ community? Do we really believe that humankind is created in the image of God? And if so, what does that say about how we love and care for our children and the sons and daughters of others who are gay? Income inequality will demand our attention, and so too will the new chapters being written about women and choices that they must make. Finally, if we are to ask about how we ought to live, I'm going to, need, I'm going to affirm that we shall need to talk coherently about how we shall die. One of the things about being in an institution ordered around science and technology was that folk were unprepared to deal with end-of-life matters. How we talk about dying and death is important now and will remain important. When I arrived at MIT in 1979, the Institute's attitude toward death was remarkable. Like a machine, we rarely paused and turned quickly to more important issues. Their approach did not speak well for the sensitivities of those who dwell in the land of science and technology. Over the course of my time there, we made some improvements in the way the community dealt with death and dying, but there is a long way to go. We will not have solved the problem by 2068, but maybe we will have learned how to be with those who grieve. I spent a lot of time grieving with others but of late, I have discovered new truths about the process. Our oldest daughter was taken from us in 2018. We walked with her down that lonesome valley, but so much for going it alone. We took strength from believing that on the far side bank of Jordan, we will be together again. As frail as those phrases are, they are strongly woven and they offer comfort. Our vision must include not only serious content about how we are to live together, but also wisdom about how we are to leave this life. The heart of our vision must be what Landon has been reaching for again and again. And again, I cite the great and good St. Craddock, who told of an encounter he had at Johnston Bible College with a high-ranking chaplain home from World War II particularly appropriate on this anniversary date. The chaplain told of the carnage he saw on the beaches of France, where as a Christian he served soldiers of every creed. And one listener raised a hand and said, how could he minister in good faith to men he did not know and whose religious state was unclear? The chaplain responded that on the beaches of Normandy, the only question one could ask was what can I do to help you? It seems to me that our mission, if we are allowed to have one as religious men and women, 
in 2068 is to ask that same question. The God we serve will expect no less of us. So I, I know we're coming to the end of our time, so I want to um, be respectful of that. So buckle up. I'm going to go quick here. Um, first of all, I, I want to express my gratitude for the opportunity to be a part of this session and to respond to Professor Volk's lecture. I have spent the past year embedded in thousands of minutes of audio and thousands of pages of transcripts of Landon's work from the past 60-ish years, so I'm quite self-consciously approaching this lecture from that vantage point. Specifically, I want to reflect on how the ideas and implications of Professor Wolf's remarks might dialogue with Landon's work and how that dialogue might provide generative opportunities to further the work of this lecture series. In his address, Professor Wolf examines two significant and intimately interconnected questions. Will religion have a role in human life? One, uh, that it's not and cannot be replaced by continued advancements in science and technology. To this first question, he offers a qualified yes. As long as human beings remain human and live, in, live on this earth, religion has a role that science and technology by their very nature are not able to fill. And this leads us to question two, what is that role? Professor Wolf gives us a compelling description of the unique and necessary role of religion as providing, quote, visions of the true and good life for all human beings. A vision of the good life sketches a portrait of the kind of humans we ought to be and provides the orienting for what we ought to desire and for how we ought to live. There are other roles that religion may attempt to fill, but these are not its main purpose. And it's confusion about this purpose, religion as primitive science or religion as primitive technology, that has led many to incorrectly conclude that religion has been or will be superseded. I find this understanding of the role of religion both deeply compelling and also, given my work over the past year, very familiar. It is an understanding of religion as providing a vision for the world of what it means to be human, a human being that flourishes, a human being that has the heart of a fighter, a human being that feels good about herself, a human being that has a life that loves to happen. Those of you who have followed Landon's work for, the, for these many decades will recognize these ideas and phrases. As Landon went into the world to spread the good news, that good news was always cast as a vision for a good life. And we have 60 years of evidence through the impact of his work that this way of understanding the role of religion is compelling and relevant, not only to those sitting in church pews, but more importantly, to those who would never walk in to sit on one. And this brings me to a point of dialogue. We can agree that this is the role of religion properly understood, and we can agree that it is a role that is necessary for human life, but it is that will in the initial question Will religion have a role in human life that casts a more troubling shadow? A shadow that is quite visible in Professor Volk's closing paragraph where, bringing attention to the Christian expression of religion specifically, he states, will the Christian faith, for instance, have a life-shaping role in 2068 that depends less on the effects of accelerating scientific and technological developments and more on the ability of Christians not to let the dark hole of their distorted religiosity swallow the light of their faith. Science and technology will not destroy the Christian faith, but Christians themselves might. The role is there. It is needed, and at some level is surely being filled because, as he describes, all human beings live by a vision, whether cognizant of it or not. Visions are being cast, ostensibly Christian visions, but are they visions that honor our fundamental belief that every human being on the planet is created in the image of God? Are we as Christians actively engaged in professing and practicing a vision of human life that is good? A life that is modeled after the transformative life of the human Jesus? Are we allowing that vision to dialogue with other visions of the good life that are present in the world today so that our own vision can continue to develop and grow and bear even greater fruit in the world? To these questions, Landon's work would say no, or at least we are not doing enough. This critique and call to cast a positive vision is present at least as far back as the preaching lectures he gave at Abilene Christian University back in 1971. And it was still there last month as he spoke to a group at Pepperdine. And although this call has always been impassioned, in recent years, you can hear the urgency in his voice increasing. 
Because in spite of the encouraging numbers that we heard in Professor Wolf's address about the global growth of religion, we can still look around in our own communities and see shrinking churches, disenchanted members, and a growing inability to even find the words to communicate this vision of life with our friends and colleagues and neighbors in a way that can be heard. If religion has such a vital and unique role in human life, why are we seeing young adults leave the church in increasing numbers? And the nuns, as they are called, the group of people who express no re religious affiliation, growing to be the second largest group in the United States. Are we seeing here in our communities what it might look like when the dark hole of our distorted religiosity, a distorted religiosity that keeps us from casting a compelling vision, begins to swallow the light of faith? Why are we struggling so much with this central role of religion to cast a compelling vision for the human life and what can be done? Perhaps first one barrier lies in our communities themselves being confused about the role of religion. The misunderstanding of religion as science or religion as technology, as Professor Volz describes, does not come just from outside religious walls. We are ourselves, as followers of Christ, quite often guilty of promoting this misunderstanding. So that precious time that could be spent crafting and practicing and presenting a compelling vision of the good life to the world is instead spent trying to figure out how to manipulate our faith to fill a role it was never meant to fill. But I think the implication that came through the strongest to me in this lecture, listening from the vantage point of Landon's work, is that the proper practice of the role of religion, as Professor Wolf describes, absolutely requires us to do something that we don't do well. And that is to read the world. Because a compelling vision of a flourishing life or a life that loves to happen comes down to the life of a particular human being that lives in a particular body, in a particular place and time. A compelling vision is an embodied vision, embodied in the real world. It must speak to the real world realities that bring death rather than life, and this is hard. But it's made even harder by a crucial point Professor Wolf made that change and the continued acceleration of change is a central feature of modern life. How can we expect to continue to speak to the concrete needs and anxieties present in this moment, in this place, for this human being, and also be prepared to speak to the ways in which they will inevitably change? How can we be expected to keep up with the rapid changes in knowledge this recognition of the enormous challenge that the modern rate of societal, societal and technological change presents to reading the world and therefore to casting a compelling vision for human life is, I think, an invaluable insight for helping us better diagnose at least one central reason why we find this so difficult to do and helps us chart a better way forward. And so I want to conclude with some comments and questions that I hope will spur further discussion. One, we need help. The task of casting a compelling vision in a rapidly changing world requires that we read the world, a world that continually changes. We need to develop ongoing dialogue partners across disciplines and embedded in diverse communities who are willing to engage in these questions with us about the good life. Where is that happening now? How can we do more of that? What forms might it take? How perhaps can this lecture series help to support this kind of dialogue? Two. We need to rethink the way we structure theological education its con and its content. To use myself, I am a product of the constantly specializing nature of theological education today. I got an excellent education at Yale Divinity School in biblical studies, but it was one where I never took, for example, a single ethics course and where I was only required to take one theology course, which, as a good child of the Church of Christ, I clearly chose the history of theology. <laughs> Part one, because... How could anything after 300 CE be of any relevance? <laughs> but taking more courses in those areas would not just have helped me as my work and interest changed over time, they would have helped me read and exegete scripture better, the thing that my degree was principally focused on. But this increased specialization also serves to sever and widen the gaps between and within disciplines when we need cross-discipline dialogue the most. This is obviously part of a much bigger problem about the nature of higher education in general, but I am curious how we could think creatively and even entrepreneurially, as Landon likes to say, as we imagine how, in a rapidly changing world, we must rethink not only initial educational pursuits, but continuing education in theology that works to facilitate dialogue across disciplines. 
This will require new pedagogical methods. What might those look like? And how could this lecture series help to explore that? And finally, how do we do a better, how do we better cultivate within our schools and our communities a clearer understanding of the role of religion as casting vision for the good life and healthier understandings of change in the life of faith? Because rapid change is not going anywhere. Landon has spoken many times about the fire and the ashes, that every generation has ashes and every generation has fire. But to move forward and to grow, we always take the fire from the altar and not the ashes. Our schools and communities of, communities of faith have been so afraid of change, we have often treated the ashes as if they hold the same value and importance as the fire. And our frantic need to hold on to those ashes year after year after year threatens to put the fire out. Or perhaps, put another way, the black hole of our distorted religiosity may be threatening to swallow the light of our faith. May we cast a bold vision full of fire and light that will bring abundant life to this world God so loves. <laughs>